Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming on this. Actually, this is probably one of the first beautiful afternoons or something. And there are people in the town imagining that. But anyway, I'm Mabel Garrison, as I'm sure you all know by now, and I want to welcome. You all, our, our speakers, our audience, on, on the behalf of the Institute for European Studies. And I, I'm really excited at today's talk or conversation as it's going to be, because first it fits into our theme on threats to democracy, as well as the broad and research theme on democratic threats and resilience. Uh, our co-sponsors today are the Institutes for Latin American Studies, uh, the Institute for the Caribbean Studies, and the Government Department. But one of the things I'm particularly excited about, about our panel today is for the last year or so, we've featured talks on autocracy, non-democracy, um, but we've looked at, at, at uh, parties, we've looked at people ruling, we've looked at threats to legitimacy, and today we're actually going to focus on, on protest mobilization and pushing back against autocracy. So that's a really new theme, and I'm not a new theme in general, but a new theme in our series, and I'm really excited, and we have our faculty members, uh, Professor Steve Carroll, who I'm sure you all know, Professor Ken Roberts from government, we have a distinguished professor, Tiago Cavallo, from the University of Lisbon, who is also the director of the Research Network and Social Movement at the Council of European Studies. And our moderator today is going to be Rachel Didi Reidel, who is the director of international studies here at Anavi. And I'm going to turn over the floor to her. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mabel. <laughs> Um, so I'm so, so pleased to be able to open um, this esteemed panel of experts on contesting autocracy. Thank you all for participating today, for being here, and for being part of the discussion. We'll be able to open it up to question and answer at the end so that you uh, should be saving your questions to respond to our, our panelists' comments. And I'd like to just especially give a warm welcome and thanks to our panelists here today, both visiting and those who are at Cornell. So let me give some brief introductions before we open it up to our moderators, which cannot do full justice to the CVs and resumes that you have before us. But um, uh, Professor Tiago Cavajo is a researcher at the Center for in Investigation and Study of Sociology at the Lisbon University Institute and a flag visiting professor in the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies at Brown University. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Cambridge and is the author of Contesting Austerity, Social Movements and the Left in Portugal and Spain, which was published last year by Amsterdam University Press. And he serves as the co-chair of the Research Network on Social Movements of the Council of European Studies. So we're very glad to have you with us here today for uh, generating this conversation and to be joined by our own expert, Professor Sidney Taro, who is the Emeritus Maxwell Upson Professor of Government at Cornell and a renowned scholar of social movements and contentious politics in Europe and around the world. His most recent books include, include Movement and Parties, Critical Connections in American Political Development, published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, and a fourth edition of his seminal book, Power in Movement, Social Movements and Contentious Politics, published last year, also by Cambridge. So thank you so much, um, Sid, for being here with us and to add to this conversation. And finally, we have Professor Kenneth Roberts, who is the Richard J. Schwartz Professor of Government at Cornell and a faculty fellow of Anaudi's own Democratic Threats and Resilience Initiative. And his most recent book was the co-edited volume, Democratic Resilience, Can the United States Withstand Rising Polarization, also published by Cambridge University Press in 2021. And his current research explores political polarization, processes of democratic backsliding, and sources of democratic resilience. So as you see here, we have really the people who we should be asking these questions about. And so our format is going to open it up to each of our panelists to give some prepared comments, and then we'll open. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Rachel. I think I'll begin because chronologically, <clears throat> my case of Italy at the end of World War II comes first, and then Portugal in 1974-75 comes next, and then Chile in 1989-90 uh, uh, comes finally. 
Um, but I want to begin in the 1960s when I was a graduate student at Berkeley and was preparing to go to Italy for my PhD research. The dominant view of the Italian transition at that time was heavily colored by the Cold War that was just revving up. The heroes were the stalwart American and British soldiers who had slogged up the peninsula, including my father-in-law uh, in 1943-44, and the villains alongside the fascists and the Germans were the communists who were determined to prepare the country for an eventual Soviet takeover. Studies of democratization in the 1970s and 80s did not go as far as the Cold War narrative, but they generally coded Italy as a case like Japan and Germany, in which the transition to democracy was the result of external uh, intervention. Now, in the wake of the third wave of democratization and the regress from democracy in countries like Hungary, Poland, and perhaps Italy, it's a good time to look back at how democracy was established in Italy between 1943 and 1946, when the monarchy was liquidated and a democratic uh, constitution was passed. I will argue that the role of parties and movements was far more central than what the classical Cold War narrative projected, or even the scientific narrative that had Italy as a result of external intervention. And let me begin by quoting my late um, maestro, Charles Tilley, who wrote in 1995 of democracy that it does not resemble an oil field or a garden, but a lake. A lake, he continued, can come into being because a mountain stream fed into a naturally existing basin, because someone or something dams up the outlet of a larger river, because a glacier melts, because an earthquake isolates a segment of the ocean, and because people deliberately dig an enormous hole and channel nearby watersheds into it, or for a number of other reasons. Into the democratic lake run rivers flowing from prior political experiences, storms born in foreign climes, or autocratic dams that hold back the democratic tides of history, at least for a time. The three cases we'll talk about today all fit in that final pattern. From the 1960s on, scholars like Seymour Martin Lipset to Charles Bush struggled to identify structural causes for democracy and democratization. But in a stimulating collection to which two of my colleagues participated, parties, movements, and making of democracy. Nancy Bermeo and Deborah Yashar pointed out that, quote, our most vibrant debates are often less about who the key players in regime change are than about which configurations of income, wealth, and inequality most shape their preferences for democracy or dictatorship. They urge us instead to focus on the key players in the transition and on their interactions as the autocratic dam is broken. Romeo and Yashar don't go as far as Tilly in designating democracy a lake, but they do focus on the mechanisms that produce democratization from autocracy. They argue, quote, that political parties and social movements are usually key to democratization's fate. Democratization, they write, is not the outgrowth of class preferences, but an institutional bargain reached or not by different coalitions of movements and parties operating within specific historical contexts. They also argue the, hello, <laughs> there we go. They also argue that the democratic transitions cannot be understood apart from the character of the regime that came before. I won't read this long uh, uh, quotation from 
uh, uh, Bermeo and Yasho's book, but I, I recommend the book to anybody who's interested in democratic transitions. I will not invade the respective territories of my two collaborators, but will focus instead on the Italian transition. Mm -hmm. and on the role of two movement parties, the communists and the Christian Democrats, that grew out of the wartime resistance. The leader of the regime of the fascist state that they overthrew had come to power in 1922 as the head of a movement party. He enjoyed unparalleled popularity until he foolishly took his country into World War II as the tale of the Hitler dictatorship. We all know how that adventure ended. The Italian army performed badly in North Africa and worse in Sicily and Southern Italy. The Duce was arrested by his own people and the German army flowed down through the Northern passes to bar the way of the British and Americans. In his history of the fascist state, Alberto Acquarone showed how that state was both bureaucratized and politicized, and even worse was its inefficiency. And our typical story has it that Mussolini once announced that he was making a tour of military airports to see the thousands of planes he had been told had been built to fight the war. Those thousands of planes were mainly mythical. And in order to fool the Duce, the real ones were flown from airport to airport that he was going to visit <laughs> while he traveled by car, stopping here and there to deliver triumphant discourses. I don't know if the story is true, but it's a wonderful one. <laughs> one reason why the fascist state looked more sturdy. Come on. <laughs> no. 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 Wow. Here we are. No, <laughs> sorry. So do you want to let me um, go back? Yeah, it's um, it's Mabel. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Mabel, you're very slow getting up on board. Uh -huh. No. Even further back. There it is. Stop right there. <laughs> One reason why the fascist state looked more sturdy than its reality was because of Mussolini's gift for transforming Italian culture. In her evocative book, Making the Fascist State, Mabel revealed how the regime fascistified Italy's principal cultural and social institution. It reorganized schools, took over popular and elite artistic institutions from cinema to theater to publishing, controlled the press, and created a web of voluntary organizations. It made peace with the Catholic Church in the Concordat and instituted demographic policies that redefined the nat nature of the Italian family. But culture was skin deep. When the Allied armies entered the peninsula, a state that the fascists had created rapidly collapsed, leaving the German army in control of most of the peninsula. Four forces were responsible for this rapid collapse. First, the implosion was of course assisted from without when the advancing allies, whose punishing air war was recently documented by Matt Evangelista, who is here, moved up the spine of the peninsula against ferocious German resistance. But second, the regime imploded from within when the king and a group of fascist elites polluted to overthrow the Duce and try to reconstitute the monarchical, monarchical liberal state. The army quickly disintegrated and many of the troops vanished into the hills where they joined the resistance, which was led by third and fourth, two social movements, the communist led one and the Catholic led one, who attacked the Germans from the rear and emerged at the heart of the post-fascist multi-party government before becoming the two poles of the emerging democratic system. At the risk of oversimplifying the complex maneuvering of the allies, the Italian elites, 
and the parties, I want to concentrate on these two parties, the Christian Democrats and the Communist Party that grew out of the resistance. First on the communists. We often think of the post-war PCI as a skillful Leninist party that did the bidding of Stalinist Russia. That was certainly the case, but two features of that party make the story more interesting than that implies. First, when communist leader Palmiro Togliatti returned to Italy from Moscow, it was with a commitment to Stalin to present, prevent the resistance from engaging in a people's war like the one that had broken out in neighboring Yugoslavia. Despite opposition from the resistance and from its working class base, the PCI followed these instructions to the letter, even creating a strategic line, what Togliatti called the Via Italiana al Socialismo. Secondly, as Robert Putnam has shown in his classic book, Making Democracy Work, the communists turned to the political fray with the strength of the subculture that they'd inherited from their predecessors, the socialists. They created an infrastructure of unions, cooperatives, and social and rec recreational institutions and businesses that sustain them against the efforts, both legal and illicit, of the Vatican and the United States. Now on the governing Christian Democrats, who are also poorly understood. We remember it as a corrupt, faction-laden laden, laden correction, collection of notables, loosely tied to the Vatican and the Americans, but that came later. We should not forget that the DC was built on the basis of a movement called Italian Catholic Action. As Gianfranco Poggi wrote in his book, quote, Catholic groups, often led by men and women, trained in Italian Catholic action and assisted by members of the lower clergy took part in the resistance movement. Following the example of their communist rivals, the DC built an organizational pyramid in the most Catholic parts of the country, building an infrastructure of unions, cooperatives, civil organizations, and educational and social organizations. We can see how enduring Oh, I'm a loser. Here we go. Oh. One before. Okay, let me get to it. All right. I think I'm having a clicker problem. This one? Yeah, that one. Stop. <laughs> okay. We can see how enduring these two subcultures were by looking at the concentration of votes for the two major parties between 1948, the first post-war parliamentary election, and 1972, when this duopoly began to uh, shatter. Uh, the percentage of votes for those two parties was always above two-thirds, and in 1948 was almost 80%. The percentage of seats in 1948 was 85 percent, 85 seats, and in 1972 was 70. I don't know how you get 8.8 percent .8 of a seat, but anyway, that's the data that I published in 1980 with my friend Peter Lang. The domestication of the communist and Christian democratic movements was disguised by the ferocious ideological conflict of the two parties defined by the International Cold War that raged around Italy. But gradually, their leaders constructed what Italian sociologist Alessandro Pizzorno called a difficult consociation, using the term that Arendt Leipart had used to describe the politics of accommodation in the Netherlands. The post-war Italian constitution gave parliamentary committees the power to legislate in many areas, Alberto Pledieri pointed out that a significant majority of the bills that these committees passed, the so-called legime, or little laws, were supported by a majority of the committee's members, which meant that the opposition communists were voting with the governing Christian Democrats behind the scenes. As Pizzorno put it, and let's see if this time we can get him, look at that. <laughs> the difficult consociation 
between the parties were, were based on hidden accords, compromises and exchanges, positions which, if they were left to the logic of public ideologies, whether ideological, religious, ethnic, or other identities, would be revealed as too conflictual and too threatening to the stability of the system. There was a moment when the domesticating trend of the poster republic might have been reversed, when a fascist gunman tried to assassinate Togliatti and he almost died. The communists' former resistance fighters pulled their rifles out of hiding and called to their leaders, Daci via, show us the way. But by then, the Via Italiana was firmly entrenched and the leadership sent them back to their homes. In other words, and here I'll close, the two major movements of the Italian Resistenza that were partly responsible for the transition from, author from autocracy emerged from the war, each with its own organizational subculture. Over the years, while they were publicly at daggers drawn, they developed subtle forms of cooperation and mutual toleration until 1989, when the Soviet Union dissolved and a series of corruption scandals destroyed the First Republic. They coalesced at that point into what became today's Partito Democratico. But that, of course, is another story. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to everyone involved in the organization. Um, I'll be discussing here the transition to democracy in Portugal and the role that social movement played throughout 70, 74 to 76, while going a bit back as well as the regime was collapsing. Um, I'll jump right into, uh, oh, that's right, I have, PowerPoint. <laughs> Just to show you a few uh, a few things here, um, but you know, Portugal normally is not very comes out very much in the literature. So I, my my effort here is to make Portugal a bit more relevant into uh, our thinking about um, this topic. So in the so-called transitology literature, Portugal is seen normally as a case of transition by rupture, where, whereby mobilizations from below were instrumental to the different political forces or parties. However, recent, recent research points out that movements were themselves important players shaping the process and in constant interaction with the political parties and the military. So we have three sets of actors with different factions within the within them, the social movements, the political parties, and the military who done have done the coup. Uh, so it's a complex story, but I'll try to simplify it here a bit. Um, the oldest and longest dictatorship in the Western world, um, called Estado Novo, or the New State, fell by a conjugation of different interrelated factors. Um, in the years preceding the middle rank military coup, um, were marked by a prolonged colonial wars, but also the biggest economic growth ever due to quick industrialization during the 60s. So Portugal pretty much followed the pattern of uh, that golden era of, of growth. Um, in this context, uh, the opposition and resistance to the regime grew and became more complex until that point was very much an elite based uh, opposition um, and a couple of attempts of military uh, coups. Um, but it became more complex with a stronger working, working class due to industrialization, student mobilizations since, the 96, since 1962, the un underground clandestine operation of the Communist Party, the Maoists as well that appeared in, in, in conjugation with, with the students and the formation of new and, and small political parties. So in a way, the story that Sid told about Italy continue that the relevant uh, actors formed before uh, is pretty much a story that repeats here as well. Uh, and despite seemingly sudden, the regime fell as a result of the mounting pressure from the streets and the internal contradictions of the regime, which I will not delve into. But as, see if we make it work. Mm. The middle. The middle? 
<laughs> Can you pass, please? <laughs> Thank you. All right, so a quote by uh, Ravi that says that the opposition did not make the coup, but it had done enough to create the crisis of regime which the, the military exploited and its component parts that I just referred to had a profound influence in the in intense struggles to determine the future of Portugal, which dominated the next 18 revolutionary months. So this military coup uh, led basically to the most intense uh, period of mobilization in the Western world after the Second World War. Um, and, but, um, Great. Uh, the, um, the dictatorship, so as the dictatorship fell and provisional, and so there was this school, there were provisional leaderships put in place, but for a while uh, during this whole process, as Pedro Ramos Pinto clearly says here, um, there was a lot of uncertainty, and this uncertainty was brought by the interplay between political, uh, the, the, the diverse political actors from movements to uh, political parties. And um, not only that, but at the beginning, Noronha points out that all seems set for a smooth transition to a liberal conservative democracy that would allow for a degree of legal institutional continuity with the dictatorship. And that few expected that the collapse of the regime would cause such a profound disruption of social order. However, with the military coup, and to use Sid's um, uh, and Charles Steely metaphor, the military opened the, flow, the floodgates for the already pressing opposition that was building at least since the 1960s. And uh, while there was this provisional institutional architecture being negotiated, the mobilizations that happened immediately at the day of the revolution with a lot of people in the streets and that continue throughout the whole period, these mobilizations changed the landscape and sped up the process and gave it new meaning. So this combination between the previous mobilization, the state crisis that unfolds with a military coup, and the spontaneous mobilizations from below create the unique scenario that characterized Portugal. It was not only a transition to democracy, but also um, a revolution. So the, as the regime fell, uh, in fact, what we have is an open field of opportunities, not only for movements, but political parties and the military and this big game of chess uh, that played out for, for almost uh, two years. But unlike other uh, transitions to democracy, and here I, uh, I like other transitions to democracy where, where we have the opposition between the old elite and the new elite, what actually um, marks this, this revolution uh, and this transition to democracy is that we only had new elites competing amongst themselves. So, um, and with the spillover that it happens immediately to the urban poor, to the peasants, to students and uh, workers, just to mention a few, we have a complete interaction between the street and the ballot box. So to use the words of uh, Mari Swatch, the, the first socialist leader, um, and then became the first prime minister, um, he tells us with no previous election, the new, uh, the elections and newly legalized political parties had to test their strength by taking part in the social struggles. So pretty much the social movements here served, um, you know, and played a role of important allies to the political parties, but also as a source of legitimacy. And so here you have a sort of the critical dates and events that I'll try to simplify uh, over the next paragraph or so, um, but pretty much what, what happens throughout this period is a process of increasing radicalization uh, as the more conservative players are purged and the radical elements of the military increasingly assume control of the state, the state apparatus. Um, the initial unity uh, falls apart and divisions emerge and we have basically two blocks 
by uh, the first uh, election of 25th of April, a year exactly after the military coup for the Constituent Assembly, where you have uh, the, uh, the two types of legitimacy at play. On one hand, the revolutionary legitimacy, and on the other hand, the electoral legitimacy. And this is pretty much because of the results of the elections, because the Communist Party that sort of an alliance with the more mili mili with the military left um, was fought to lead this process, then sees himself itself to be in third place with other forces, the center left and the center right at first. So um, these two parties basically start contesting um, the whole notion of revolutionary uh, legitimacy. And at some point, as the process radicalize, they leave the provisional government and it begins uh, the hot summer, which we can see more clearly here uh, with the different types. of. So this is data from the work done by Diego Palacio Cerezales, uh, sort of protest event analysis. And so, uh, as you can see, as the hot summer um, in conflict escalates, you have the anti-communists and the radicals against each other um, with the possibility as the military splits between moderates and radicals of a, a civil war. But as uh, the moderates take over some strategic positions in the state and the military and the PS, the center left and the center right return to have the government, the military left is removed from, from power in a way. And as this conflict evolves, the moderate military now controlling most of the, most of the strategic state positions that they were um, slowly getting into puts a place to control the reminder of the military left. It is here that on November 25th, when an attempt who by an unhappy military division over some decisions uh, that were made about military leadership were made, the, they try this coup and the moderates activate their plan to stop the insurgency and dominate the state apparatus. But we could think of as that, the, you know, that the masses, the social movements could have um, tried to support this coup. But actually, um, re what research shows is that this attempted coup fails because uh, as Pedro Ramos Pinto shows in his research about the housing movement, um, the, the housing movement simply did not accept the radicalization process led by the revolutionary bloc and directed their strength towards democratization. Here I quote Pedro, as an active choice by the rank and file and not the instruction from above. Um, and there are a few more examples that I could give, but um, I'll move on. So with the military, the more radical factions of the military under control, democratization proceeds with popular support. Uh, and so we can see that it's not only an elite or grassroots process, but actually an interaction between them. And I'll conclude with some words on um, the Communist Party and, and, uh, that, uh, and the position, the more defensive position that they seem to have taken um, when the understanding that they could not control the state um, and uh, was losing terrain, terrain to more radical forces in order to, it seems to me that in order to keep its position, it conceded to the more moderates and in exchange for, domest for domesticating, domesticating somehow mobilization and keeping their place in the regime that would come. So in a way, social movements brought the revolution, shifted the field, were important in, in building democracy and getting welfare concessions from institutional actors, but also at the peak of the conflict, they were crucial to stop the takeover by the revolutionary bloc. Thank you. Okay, well, let me just start by, by thanking Sid and Tiago for being, being part of this, and a, a special thanks uh, to Tiago for taking time from his uh, his leave at, at Brown University to come visit us at Cornell and share with us some of his, his work on the Portuguese case. As we were talking about this, we, we were struck by some of the, the parallels across the three different cases. I'll be talking about the Chilean case, but the parallels in trying to understand 
the dynamics of interaction between uh, the grassroots level and the elite level, and then the interaction between political parties and social movements as well. And so I'll reflect a little bit upon that in, in the Chilean case. And I'll just start by saying the Chilean case is, is widely viewed, at least within the political science literature, as being a paradigmatic case of what we call a pacted democratic transition, right? Uh, and it's also seen as a case uh, where the transition unfolded through highly institutionalized arenas. And so the notion of it being pacted is basically referring to the, the fact that the terms of the transition were negotiated between elite actors, uh, some of them from within the military regime and some of them from the opposition political parties, in particular, the Christian Democratic Party in the center and the Socialist Party on the center left. Uh, so it was a negotiated elite-led transition in many ways, and it proceeded through certain institutional channels. So the transition in many respects begins with the defeats of Augusto Pinochet, the military dictator, in a plebiscite in 1988 that took place under the terms uh, of his own constitution. And then after his defeat in the plebiscite, there were a series of negotiations in the following year for constitutional reforms uh, between leaders of the regime and leaders of the opposition forces. And then finally, they opened up uh, for open democratic elections at the end of 1989, leading to the victory of a 16-party coalition of opposition forces led by the Christian Democrats and the Socialists. Uh, so that's sort of the, the conventional narrative about the Chilean transition of it being heavily pacted and, and highly institutionalized in its basic process. So I think this conventional narrative is not necessarily wrong, but I think it's incomplete. Uh, in particular because it neglects the role of the mass social protest movement that rocked the military dictatorship between 1983 and 1986. And the, the ways in which the protest movement created certain divisions within the authoritarian coalition in Chile. Uh, and in many respects, it also, I would argue, opened the door for the eventual pacted transition that took place. It's not at all clear to me that that democratic transition would have taken place in the absence of the protest movement. Right, the protest movement itself uh, began with, with the, the labor unions, the Copper Workers Federation, Chile being a big copper exporting country, the Copper Workers Federation uh, in a country where the labor movement had really been dormant for 10 years since the end of the Pino, you know, since the end of the Allende uh, regime with the military coup that brought Pinochet to power. Uh, but the copper workers called for uh, for monthly protest meeting uh, movements that began in March of 1983 in the midst of a severe financial crisis. Uh, and there were many different kinds of social actors and uh, civic groups that were part of the protest movement. The opposition parties uh, played some role within the opposition movement, in particular the Communist Party at the grassroots, uh, but you had other political parties as well, uh, and a number of other civic and social movements. In particular, I, I point to the role of young people in low-income districts, the barrios or the, the poblaciones, as they're called in, in Chile. So the young people really were the ones who were building the barricades and throwing rocks at the, the, the military vehicles and, and really fighting in the streets against the Pinochet regime. So Chile went through this period uh, of widespread social protest between 1983 and 1986. I should also point out there was an armed insurgent movement that emerged in that same time period with some political ties to the Communist Party. And so the combination of mass protest as well as an armed insurgent movement created a lot of fear on the parts of the military and the civilians who supported the military regime, in particular, the business community. This is, you know, keep in mind, Chile was where neoliberalism began. So the business community was uh, very fervent uh, supporters of the Pinochet regime. Uh, but there was a lot of fear on the part of the civilian and military elites of, of uh, this insurgent movement, this mass insurrection from below, and their concern was in many respects that Chile could follow the, the path that you saw in Portugal, that there would be some sort of revolutionary rupture uh, in the regime. Uh, and this was, of course, very, you know, something that was seen as being very threatening to them. And, and ultimately, the many key elements of the authoritarian coalition began to see the continuation of the Pinochet regime in its current form um, as both destabilizing 
and as a source of potential, as really a source of permanent conflict within the country. And really, they came to see it as, as creating the specter of some sort of revolutionary rupture uh, that was very fearful to them. So ultimately, key elements within the authoritarian coalition uh, became that they shifted their calculation and began to recognize that some sort of democratic opening was really inevitable uh, and probably necessary within the country. And their perception was that it was uh, that they would be better off to engage in that process to try to control it from above, or if they couldn't completely control it for, from above, to at least try to negotiate its terms. Uh, with the elements of the opposition that were deemed to be acceptable. So basically, that was the Christian Democrats and the socialists, especially when the latter moved away from their stride in opposition to the neoliberal model and basically conceded uh, that if you got rid of Pinochet, we'd have a democratic opening, but we would continue the neoliberal model, which is essentially what takes place uh, within the country. So ultimately, there are a series of negotiations that take place uh, between the opposition uh, leadership of the, of the political parties and the regime. And in particular, what I think was very important was they leaned on Pinochet to make sure that the plebiscite in 1988 was going to be a genuine exercise in democratic contestation. In other words, it, wa it wasn't going to be simply a pro forma uh, rubber stamping of the Pinochet regime as Pinochet had done in a constitutional plebiscite in 1980 uh, under highly authoritarian conditions. Um, so in 1988, in the run up to the plebiscite, uh, they opened uh, opened up to the to the mass media. So they liberalized the restrictions on the media. They also re-legalized the political parties, allowed them to begin to organize again, and they allowed the political parties to, to campaign openly against the Pinochet uh, regime and in the run-up to the plebiscite campaign. Also, critically, they leaned on Pinochet to accept the results of the plebiscite when he lost. It's not at all clear that he, he was well, surely not inclined to accept the results. He never dreamed he could lose. Uh, but ultimately, the other members of the military you know, insisted that they follow through with this process. Uh, and again, sort of the, the way, the specter of some sort of insurrectionary alternative was weighing heavily on their calculations. So this is what you might think of in social movement scholarship as a radical flank effect. The fear of a more radical outcome induced the hardliners within the regime to accept some sort of limited democratic opening. The catch, of course, then, if the mass insurrectionary movement was necessary to get a pact of transition to democracy, the terms of that pact of transition also thoroughly demobilized the social movements. Uh, so leading into the electoral process, essentially the energy on the streets gets channeled, at least partially channeled into the institutional arena. And indeed the energy on the streets withers uh, quite dramatically in the years ahead. So Chile ends up with a pact of democratic transition, but it takes place under a set of institutional restrictions that really uh, place severe constraints on, on popular democratic majorities within Chile. Uh, and in particular, uh, a set of institutional constraints that overrepresented the political right. Pinochet left behind. He locked things down in many ways um, institutionally, and they did so in particular to try to lock in the neoliberal economic model. Uh, so as they did this, Chile, of course, becomes if, you know, for much of the, the mainstream scholarship, Chile is viewed as a showcase of Latin American democracy for the first 20 years. It was a period where there's tremendous demobilization uh, of society, really a high level of social quiescence. But of course, what was taking place was a highly technocratic, uh, very restricted democratic regime. And ultimately, society begins to push back again. And so there's a crisis of democratic representation that emerges in the country, and you get a remobilization beginning with the student movements in 2006 and 2011, and then a massive social uprising in 2019 as a reflection of this crisis of democratic representation. So I'm not going to go into all of those more recent dynamics, but ultimately it's a case where the one, what I think we have to understand is the way in which these processes of social mobilization and then demobilization and then remobilization again, how they have shaped the contours of Chile's contemporary political development. I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so some really fascinating parallels, right, from a cross-regional perspective and thinking about the relationship between 
uh, elites, social movements, political parties, military actors, and how those different constellations create pressures for institutional formation and times of transition, reactions to those institutional um, forms of democratic opening um, over the long term. So I want to open it up to questions, but while you're thinking of your question, I have one to kick us off. I'm going to take the prerogative. And to those of us who are those who are joining us um, virtually, please feel free to put your comments in the um, Q&A function on the webinar. We'll, we'll be able to see those as well. So your um, comments have really raised a lot of questions and, and points of connection. And I wanted to just start off by thinking about the nature of civil society, right? Because we know that civil society can be both pro-democratic and mobilizing around democratic rights and freedoms. Um, and yet also civil society can be anti-democratic and have its own uh, positions uh, of limiting the idea of who participates, who counts as a part of the nation, uh, who should have rights and how those should be expressed. So in thinking about our kind of contemporary period of democratic backsliding, we often see social movements protesting to kind of resist efforts to weaken democratic checks and balances, right? They're, they're sources of democratic resilience. Um, but we also see the potential for kind of autocratizing civil society movements. So in the cases that you are looking at, how um, important do you think protests are in blocking autocratic measures and keeping democratic spaces open? And how much do you see cleavages within civil society that may also um, push autocratic stability or, or autocratization? Um, so how are you thinking about these, the kind of uh, dual-sidedness of, of social protest and mobilization? We can start with the same chronology or anyone can feel free to jump in. So, um... Very stimulating as usual, Rachel. Uh, it's very nice to have an Africanist perspective on what happened in Italy in, in the 1940s. Um, I think the one thing that's really interesting about Italy in the 1940s is the difference between what was happening on the surface and what was happening below the surface. On the surface, there was a clear anti-democratic force, the Communist Party. Parenthetically, there was a neo-fascist force also, but it was extremely weakened by its association with the now defunct Mussolini regime. And so the neo-fascists survived through the entire post-war period until today when they have given Italy a neo-fascist prime minister, uh, but it was extremely modest in its electoral strength and in its social movements. It was only in the 1960s, in response to the left-wing movements of 1968, that the neo-fascists emer emerge as a violent force and are responsible for some of the most violent outrages. So for the first 20 or 30 years after 1943, it's the communists who are seen as the anti-democratic force. And, and as I suggested, there's a kind of a double game going on. At the rhetorical level, uh, they and the Christian Democrats are at daggers drawn. At the transactional level, they are doing business with one another. And by the 1980s, they're operating, as Pete Sordano called it, in a, in a kind of a, a consociational way, dividing up the spoils of government. For example, the public radio and TV stations uh, were uh, divided into three parts, and the leadership of each one was allocated to a different political party, very much a proportional allocation of, of resources. Um, so there's, there's a weakened right-wing opposition. There is a very strong left-wing opposition, which is widely seen both in the United States and in Italy as an anti-democratic force. However, there's a process of democratization that's occurring below the surface, particularly in the two main regions of Christian democratic and communist implantation. The Christian Democrats in the Northeastern area of the country, which is highly Catholic, 
the communists in the central area of, of the country, <clears throat> which has a long uh, popular and progressive history. In each one of these regions, the respective parties are creating a set of buttresses to support their hegemony. And those buttresses have a political economic uh, basis. They're not simply political front organizations, but they are organizations that strengthen the economic foundation of their respective regions. And, and this is the most interesting part, beneath the surface, they are turning communist and Christian democratic militants into entrepreneurs. Cooperatives, for example, in the um, uh, uh, central Italian region give rise to the most important cooperative supermarket network in the country. Well, if you go into a co-op in Florence or Bologna, you won't know the difference between that co-op and other supermarkets because they're, they're a business. And so over the long run, very slowly, these communist militants turn into entrepreneurs and organization uh, people. And we see these changes, particularly after 1968, when a new generation of militants who've come out of the student movement enters the Communist Party. They are largely middle class. They are highly educated. Uh, they have organizational skills and their ideologies look much more like the progressive generation of 1960s radicals in the United States, Britain, France, and Germany than like former communist uh, supporters. As one indicator, until the 1960s, the major source of new Communist Party militants came from the Young Communist League. They came from, they were red diaper ba babies in the American uh, uh, sense. Uh, after 1968, the largest proportion of new communist militants come out of the trade unions or out of the student organizations. So there's a fundamental shift in the nature of the party growing up through its recruitment from civil society. All right, thank you for the question. Um, I think I was thinking about, about when you were asking the question that probably, you know, my, my, my uh, folk, seems to reflect some kind of, uh, that didn't exist any kind of right wing or conservative push or resistance to what was happening. But in fact, if we go back before um, the, the, the revolution itself, what we see is a story that I didn't tell, but um, there is the uh, replace, uh, a replacement of the dictator, Salazar by Marcel Caetano, and there is the start of what they call the Marcellist Spring, where the regime seemed to be opening up um, to, um, you know, democratize. Um, but that, you know, because of internal tensions of the regime, there were the so-called ultras that more attached to the president of the republic because the dictator was the executive, basically, that kind of stopped that process. But what that led to was actually to a more, um, uh, a stronger resistance to, to what was happening. Um, in any case, so um, that is, seems to be what happens is when the dictatorship closes again, those who wanted democratization had a bigger push and were able to um, to lead to lead to uh, to, to to the coup uh, that was led by the military. But even there, there is some sort of reversal of the hierarchies because the generals uh, and the top leaders of the military had lost their face. the the top The top people in the regime were totally aware of what was going on, and they didn't. What, what they were unable to stop the, the captains because it was a movement of captains and middle rank officers that was um, leading um, to, uh, to, to what happened in April 74. But they, there was inaction, the regime was blocked. So actually by closing down, 
and resisting what was happening, they led, in fact, to um, to the to to what happened to the revolution and to be purged out of the process. Um, and, <laughs> and, and so even during the, the whole process, there are elements where um, the first, the provisional president of the Republic was still very much someone that wanted to keep the colonies in a more, in a sort of federation um, until the pressure from the streets and from the military, the more radical military led him to be replaced by a more moderate general that accepted the colonization itself. So even if there are democratic and anti-democratic elements in this story, what seems to happen is that the democratic push that happens throughout the, the late 60s and 70s, even if there is a resistance then by the regime, is to uh, that the more the democratization was almost uh, uh, a, a conquest of the people demonstrating in the streets. Uh. I just want to say that in in my study of struggles for and against democracy, I found myself moving away from any sort of essentialist understanding of civil society and trying to, to think of civil society more as kind of a battleground mm -hmm. where you have both democratic and autocratic forces that are contesting each other. Um, and you see this in a lot of places. I mean, certainly historically in the Chilean case, under the, under the Yende regime prior to Pinochet, there was massive social, social mobilization and protest on both sides, for and against Allende. And, and much of the much of the protest against the Allende was very explicitly calling on the military to intervene. Uh, in fact, there were there were there were protests at in front of the houses of the uh, military generals, uh, calling them chickens for not getting involved in the political process and protecting the constitutional order, and demanding that the military regime uh, that the that the military intervene in the political process. And so that's a pretty good example of. Of how civil, you know, there are elements within civil society uh, that can be pushing an authoritarian direction. And, you know, some people talk about civil society and uncivil society. Uh, you might think of it in those terms. But I think when you look at contemporary struggles around democracy, just in the last couple of weeks, there have been protests in both in Mexico and in Israel, protests against governments for what are perceived to be steps that weaken uh, institutional checks and balances. Um, and so it's an interesting dynamic. I think the Polish case is quite interesting in recent years where there's been considerable societal pushback against efforts of sort of a right-wing populist government to narrow uh, democratic spaces. I'm struck by the Hungarian case. My so I'm not a specialist on Hungary, but my perception is that that civic pushback has been weaker in the Hungarian case. And indeed, uh, the urban go government has been able to, uh, along the lines of what we were saying earlier, to, to use elements within civil society uh, as an organized base of support for his autocratic political project to strengthen the base of his political party. Um, and so I think, as, as I said, I, I see civil society not as being intrinsically or essentially democratic, but really as being um, an arena for political contestation between different kinds of political forces, some of which uh, are without question very democratic, and often some of which I think can create a bulwark against processes of democratic backsliding. But in other cases, you see civil society actually you know, playing along with autocratic political projects. There's an element of that, I think, I would argue, within the United States um, as well in contemporary times. So that's very concerning to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, do we have any questions from the audience? Or I can keep going. Yes, please. Yeah, well, thank you all for, for your presentations. Uh, I'm Matias, I'm from Chile, and, I, and I ha I've been part of this uh, current, like, uprising and social movements. I was in my, the university the years in which the social the student movement started and everything. Uh, so one of the lessons that, that I, I see a commonality with the cases that you're studying is like the connection of these social movements and the, the acceptance of political parties as a, as a possibility of connecting this, this social uh, organization with a the, the dispute of the, the state of uh, the power of the state uh, and political parties has a legitimate uh, resource 
of the, to continue this the struggle from the civil society to uh, different stages. The current president of Chile is one example of that. From the student movement now in the the president of, of the country. Uh, so in those terms, like the cases, some of the cases that you mentioned, is this connection of social uprising, social movement, and political parties. And I don't know if now thinking about the lessons and the, the title of this this poem uh, about the lessons of that I, I see that social movements now is not like the common the common idea to see political parties as a legitimate uh, form of organization. And it's difficult to make those connections. And and my question for all of you is this: How do you see this this phenomenon of connection of connecting social movements and political parties in the case of the U.S. in the in the in the last uh, five years, like eight years, uh, thinking maybe as, assuming that the Donald Trump government uh, had elements of an autocracy kind of government, and and the, and the, and you had like experience, you experienced social uprisings, the Black Lives, uh, Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, but also uh, far right or uh, new organization. So. There, this movement around in, within civil society, uh, how connected or not is with the political parties in the case of the, U, the US, how different is from the case that you were studying? Yeah, okay. So I want to bet with myself. Uh, I, I bet with myself that it would that it would take five minutes before somebody asked a question about Donald Trump. And it's, and it's taken ten minutes, so I, I was pretty close. I don't, I don't object to at all to your broadening the discussion to the United States. In fact, I recently wrote a book called Movements and Parties, which is basically uh, based on the the history of movement party relations in the United States. So I'm very interested in this, and so are, so are um, my two colleagues here. I think one of the things we um, often forget is that when movements turn into parties, as they did in Italy in 1945 to 48, and in Chile and Portugal, when movements turn into parties, they sometimes, as in Chile, uh, deflate the social movement sector, um, in part because they absorb social movement activists into the party organization. That happens in all three of these cases, but in part because they shift the focus of the public from what was happening in the streets to, to what's happening in the institutions. And this too happened in all, all three countries. But what is less clear is that what we might call the social movement ethos disappears from those parties as they become institutionalized. I'd like to recommend the, um, the work of what we hope will be a future Cornell professor, um, uh, Santiago Andria uh, from uh, Argentina, whose book on the Bolivian mass, uh, the movement towards socialism, uh, reflects exactly this logic, that uh, a movement turned into a party but the movement ethos never left. It remained there uh, in part because of the, the, the nature of the leadership of the MAS. Uh, after all, the leader was a movement leader, but in part because of the organization, the particular organizational structure that that movement uh, retained, which continued to provide a role within civil society for, for movement activists. That didn't happen in Italy. What happened in Italy was that the parties shrewdly co-opted the movements and gave movement activists important roles, often very well-paid roles within the party organization or within the parliamentary uh, uh, elite of, of the two major parties. It's only in the late 1960s that independent social movements reappear. Until then, most social movements were controlled by the two major parties. Uh, and, uh, and this is why 1968 is such a dramatic shift uh, 
in Italy, because for the first time, independent social movements break away from what Italian uh, political scientists call la partitocrazia, the, the, the bureaucratization of, of the social movements. I can't speak for these other two countries, but in Italy, it was quite striking that the, the, the movement ethic was, was co-opted and subdued uh, very uh, intentionally by the two major parties. Well, I'm I'm no expert in the United States as Ken and Sid are, um, so I can't really speak uh, about about that. I think one important thing um, that you might want to look at is uh, a chapter by Unspeed Crazy where he talks about the different electoral systems and how that shapes social movements as well. Because I think. The cases that we are looking at, uh, the the electoral system is very different, for instance, from the US or the UK, where the interaction between movements and parties, uh, it's slightly different. Um, I think that also uh, this comes in waves, and I think in the Portuguese case especially, um, there is certainly a, a deflation, or as I was telling, uh, a domestication of the movements after somehow you had some cases of political violence in the mid 80s, as you had in, in other countries, uh, Italy and Germany uh, and, and, and et cetera. But, you know, it was quickly controlled. There, was there were groups that didn't have their way into the regime. Uh, um, and so they, they were putting some bombs basically and robbing some banks. Um, but it's interesting that slowly the regime in Portugal, um, it's the, the 80s in Portugal are some, uh, Boventura de Sousa Santos says that it's in between, you know, we don't really understand if it's a capitalist or a socialist system due to, um, due to the, you know, the mix between the two. And so what you see throughout the 80s is mainly trade unions, labor, the labor movement, there were some IMF interventions. What is really interesting is that from the 90s onwards, um, you start seeing students as well. Um, big, why? Because as you turn into a more capitalist system, because nationalizations, all the nationalizations that were done in the, during the revolution, they were re they start to be reversed, reversed in, in the 1990s. And there's the introduction of student fees at the university level, which leads a new generation of activists to um, emerge. And so what happens is that that gives the motivation to form a new party from the old Trotskists and Maoists and so on that unite under the left bloc. And the left bloc has systematically since then been somehow um, integrated a lot of the demands from this generation that emerged in the 90s. As a party. As a party. As a party. As a party, but also um, involved in trying to lead the movement right. somehow. And that creates disputes that I talk about in my book right. during the austerity years. Right. Who is that, you know, should it be autonomous or not? But the left bloc still keeps that, and it brought really important uh, and channeled really important um, demands into the political system, such as uh, the abortion. And they were able to mobilize uh, for a second referendum of abortion. They were able to mobilize um, to to allow for for gay marriage and so on. So you see that move this waves and flows of movements that integrate into, and now we have a new wave, uh, but more on the other side of the political spectrum due so to- Neither one of us, interestingly enough, neither one of us left the comfort of our relative <laughs> countries, Italy and Portugal, to answer this gentleman's <laughs> important question about movement party relations in the United States. And, and so I would like to just add one thing which I think is critical, and that is that over the past few decades, there has been a hollowing out 
of the American party system. We could go into the details for when this began, what the causes were, but let's leave that out. What's clearly the case is that the central party organizations have been hollowed out and weakened. And the result of that, in the case of the Republican Party, is that it was opened to the invasion by a social movement and led by a social movement entrepreneur, which is my definition of, of Donald Trump. It was open because it had been weakened. And now what we see, and we saw this just in the last weekend at the conservative uh, annual conference, and now what we see is that the social movement ethos that Donald Trump brought to the, to the, to the government has really become the dominant ethos in the Republican Party. Uh, and it's, it's quite striking that, for example, the former governor of South Carolina, who, who then became uh, the country's United Nations representative under Trump, and who is running for president, who would like to run for president, when she gave her speech at this conservative conference, she was booed. Unheard of uh, in the history of American political parties that a candidate for the presidency who speaks to a conservative conference would be booed. So what we're seeing is the movementization of the Republican Party. And, and I think that's going to be a fundamental factor in the next few years or possibly even decades of American politics. Pardon me if I talked so long, but I, I got involved in Italy and I forgot to answer your question. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we see that maybe other? I think we've done a pretty good job responding if there are other questions. I'll call, I'll call them back, but I just wanted to add one thing to this question as well, which is um, two other kind of global dimensions that we see on this, on this point. And one is the way in which Yes, the movementization of the party to since that term. And then I would add the NGOization of the movement, mm -hmm. right? Because NGOs are internationally funded or in the United States, you know, it can be a kind of living that's stable, but also can, can create a vacuum of the movement ethos itself as they move into technocratic or apolitical spaces, mm -hmm. at least in the African cases. Um, so that's also a kind of, fighting dynamic, some civil society organizations in Africa have also kind of approached um, researcher, researchers recently have said, what should our relationship to parties be, right? As they come to us and seek to you know, build from us. And then I would say that the second dimension also depends, and this comes back to the nature of the party system and each party individually, right? Because where you have more fluid party systems or weaker individual parties that have been hollowed out, then civil society maintaining a con deep connection to mobilizing the masses through an active civil society becomes a strategy of candidate campaigns, right? Like they need the social movements to be mobilized and active because you don't have the party. So they're almost alternative strategies. And that's what we've seen through a lot of places where there are strong independent candidates who don't want to have the party apparatus. They fund civil society. They fund the mobilizations and the protests and get the market women out and you know print their signs and their t-shirts. And it's to create their future um, voter base. So I think that those also are some connection points in a cross-regional base. It is a very good article in this book on strong parties and weak parties in Africa. <laughs> Just rehashing my life. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a two-finger maybe? Yeah, oh, I don't forget the political <laughs> science ritual, but anyway, <laughs> I, I, before we get too far away from it, I, want, I wanted to follow Sid's comments, which I, I basically agree with. But the only other thing about the American system is that we also have all these crazy sort of groups that I think we that had been there for a while, like the Proud Boys or uh, these very extreme groups that then somehow are feeding into these parties. They may not go to CPAC or something like that, but they also create an, an alternative energy out there. And I think we became more aware of these groups on January 6th when we found out they were all there. And um, you know, I think I have no idea. It's an empirical question whether they exist in other countries. 
Uh, but it seems to me that that adds a particular danger to the American system besides, uh, I haven't, I just get to see CPAC this weekend because I couldn't, but I'm going to rewind the tapes as it were. So, um, thank you. Matt, thank you for your question. Well, yeah, thank you for the fascinating discussion. That you know, two elements I was curious to learn more about. One is how the movements and the parties sustain themselves during the years of repression. And the other is uh, the international dimension. So it seems to me these parties that played a role in these movements were repressed. The parties were, were illegal and even the Catholic action movement had been depoliticized under pressure from Mussolini from the Vatican. So how do they sustain their political culture in order to emerge at the moment to contest autocracy, which was really your main focus, it seemed to me. Uh, and the other dimension was the, the international one. And in the Italian case, we know Mussolini lost the war, the United States played a dominant role in the post-war settlement, would not have allowed the communists to come to power by electoral means. Um, that one, I guess, is clearer to me, but I'm curious about the others. The, the colonial wars played a factor. Yeah. But what about the European context? The fact that there was a strong social democratic party in Germany that was supportive of the changes in Poland, that the Italians had set a precedent by convincing the United States to let the Socialist Party play a role in a coalition government. Um, how, how important was that? You know, would the US, without that kind of pressure, have permitted Portugal to undergo uh, these changes. And the U.S., I think, looms pretty large in the Chilean case, too. I, I mean, as a, as a force for supporting, you know, Chile, not the, not the changes, right? I mean, how, how do you assess the, the U.S. role? Yeah. Great well, maybe I'll, I'll say a few words about the, <clears throat> the Chilean case, um, where, I mean, certainly the U.S. Uh, supported the the coup against uh, against uh, Allende and supported the, the Pinochet government uh, for the first 10 years or so. By the mid 80s, as the winds were shifting in Latin America, the US became critical of Pinochet and began to support a democratic opening, but very much the kind of limited democratic opening that eventually transpired. Um, and so by the late 80s, the US was supporting uh, the kind of active transition that eventually took place. But the US obviously was supporting the Pinochet regime for the most part uh, while it was there. The parties, the, the, so the, in terms of what happened to the parties under Pinochet, uh, the Christian, all the parties um, uh, lost their, their legal status. The conservative parties were not banned, but they basically self-dissolved and said, thank you, Pinochet, we don't need to exist anymore. We put all of our confidence in you. The Christian Democrats uh, became illegal and just sort of, but they still existed. Uh, the Mir, which was the the really radical student based left, the Mir was crushed militarily, um, and some some cadres, you know, existed in the exterior, but they were crushed internally. The socialists and the communists, the socialists, the socialists and the communist parties were both had three consecutive decapitations. The entire leadership was wiped out um, and uh, with disappearances and executions, those who survived left the country. And so they had to basically relocate their leadership outside, outside the country. Uh, the communist networks underground were still there in Chile, but not able to really organize in any significant way. The socialists all that disappeared in terms of any internal organization, but then they were reconstituted in the 1980s. And the Communist Party was revived after the key leader came back into the country in the late 70s and rebuilt the Communist Party as they sort of took up arms and became involved in the mass protest movement in the 80s. Uh, but essentially, they, they survived through clandestine networks. There was no open political or organization on the left in Chile for the first 10 years. Uh, under the dictatorship at all. So the Italian case under fascism was was like that. Uh, the Communist Party was decapitated and a lot of the leaders had to leave. But there was um, a special factor that I discovered when I was doing research, and that is that a lot of communist militants survived the 20 years of fascism in the unions. That is, in the fascist unions, 
Uh, and I discovered this quite by accident. I should have known it, but I'm not a historian. When I went to do research in the CGIL archives, that is the communist-led union archives in Milan, and I went in to ask about where the archives were kept, and the librarian who I spoke to said, well, until recently, we had all the archives of the Milanese fascist unions right here, but nobody wanted to look at them, so we threw them out. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't know if he was telling the truth that they, you know, nobody wanted to look at them, but in any case, they threw them out. And what I understood was that many people who ended up as communist cadres after 1945 had survived the 20 years of fascism in the, in the fascist unions. So there, there were things that you could do. And the equivalent of that on the Christian Democratic side was, of course, that you could work for the Vatican. De Gasperi, who emerged as the first Christian Democratic uh, Party secretary after the war, spent the war years in the, in the Vatican Library doing research, and he was secretly beginning to organize for the post-war war period. All right, so as for uh, Portugal, I mean, there's a lot of um, going to, so how the, the, the Communist Party in Portugal was sort of similar. It had underground operation, but with the, different wo the difference was that the leadership was in exile. Because in the, in the beginning of the 60s, Cunhal was able to escape prison and fled to Moscow and then to Paris. So, um, and from there was able to um, meet with the opposition in, in exile. Um, so they were trying to, to do that. Um, one interesting thing that happened as this, the working class became a bit stronger because, because of industrialization was that um, in 68, 69, um, the new leader of, of the regime opened up the trade unions with voting. What ended up happening is something similar to the story you're telling is that the communists and other left-wing groups sort of take over, um, sort of take over the, the unions from the regime and start acting from there. But also it's very interesting because a lot of the, you had a lot of uh, migration from the countryside. And one of the strategies they use, as a Duronia that I refer and wrote uh, brilliantly about that, because he was able to show how these workers come to the city and start working in the, in the industries. And when they go and make demands, they don't show any leadership. Why? Because they don't want the leaderships to be uh, <laughs> in prison. So they go as a group to make the demands, and that generates also conflicts with the police. Um, with As for the international context, um, yes, the colonial wars were the main point for the, the military to, to, to do the coup and try uh, and to have the, their program for democ democratize, develop, and decolonize. Um, the Socialist Party actually had was formed in West Germany in 73. Although there was already the socialist action that was formed in the 60s, if I'm not wrong, they then became a party because somehow they knew things were about to happen, right? Um, and so they were starting to prepare for, for something like that. And actually they were getting throughout the revolution money from West Germany as well. And then they had a lot of support. You know, the U.S. was like, well, who do we support? And they decided to go with, with Mani Swaj, the leader of the socialists. And it's funny, I was, I, I, I'm not sure how um, important that is, but at some point during that period, you had some, um, some Navy, some U.S. Navy <laughs> coming to, in, to be in front of Lisbon. So that might have played a, a bit of a role for the moderation that was taken over 75. Um, thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating panel and um, a good opportunity to think about these cases together. I, I sort of wanted to draw on a thread that 
Matt mentioned and that you were all commenting on, um, which is about the role of the of the right in some way of the opposition from the right. So in some ways that there is opposition from the left to these autocracies is not that surprising because these autocracies are largely autocracies of the right. What's kind of more interesting, at least to me, is that we see opposition from the center right and the right, and lo and behold, in all the cases that's coming out of Christian Democrats. And so I wanted to ask you all to sort of reflect a little bit about the role of opposition from the center right right, and in particular Christian democracy, because from what I was learning from each of you, the the role was slightly different in each of the cases. So it sounds like in the Italian case, you really have significant mobilization. They have a lot of infrastructure that they're using actively to, um, to work through the transition. In, in Portugal, uh, it's quite significant that the Americans chose to support a socialist candidate. I tend to think of Portugal as a place where the left is quite strong. The main players, the sort of center of the action is the communists and the socialist party. The people's party is there though, but like maybe not so influential. And I don't know if Chile somewhere in between, it's, uh, they're also quite present, but maybe playing more of a role. So anyways, I'm, I kind of wanted to ask a little bit more about this group, given that what they're doing is sort of theoretically uh, nuanced, I think. They are a party of the center right or the right, depending on how we classify them, that is opposing uh, an autocratic regime, and in some cases, seem to be doing a lot of mobilization, a lot having a lot of influence, and maybe in others, not so much. So, uh, in Italy, Isabel, the 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 Christian Democrats were were already um, almost factionalized right from the start. People like uh, Dossetti. Uh, was it were were hoping for a Christian revolutionary direction for the DC, uh, and uh, and until 1948, he 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 continued to have strong support within the movement, basically from former resistance people, until he was defeated. Um, and one reason why he was defeated was because the Americans threw their support to De Gasperi and to what was emerging as a, a pro-capitalist, pro-Western, uh, uh, anti-totalitarian anti uh, current within the movement. The American position was not to support the right. The American position was really much more nuanced, although it, a lot of the activity was secret. The American position was to try and split the left. And you see this most distinctly in the trade union movement. At the start of the post-war period, there was a unified CGIL, uh, Socialist, Communist, Christian Democratic. And the CIA very quickly went to work to suborn both the Christian Democratic and the Socialist currents within the CGL, financing the split that eventually created a threefold uh, 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 trade union movement. And the result of this, many, many people say it was on purpose, I'm not sure it was, but the result of this was that unitary bargaining on the part of all three confederations against industry didn't happen until the 1960s. It's only in the 60s that the unions get back together and say, this is ridiculous. Our job is to defend the workers, and we can't defend the workers if we allow ourselves to continue to be riven by ideological fractures. So, and, and I guess this is a commercial for my movement-based approach, it's only when the workers begin to be influenced by the movements of the 60s and to, and to threaten to shift to the left that the three trade union confederations get together in the name of working class solidarity. So that so really the Americans, you know, who have the reputation for having supported the right, in effect, they did support the right by supporting the center, if you will. There I go. I forgot to say something, which is it's not entirely clear what the Soviet Union 
also wanted the, the communists to do. And some say that, in fact, they wanted for things to end up as they ended up and they didn't want to disrupt and to have a communist country in the sphere of influence of the US. So that's, that might also have played a role. So your question is, what is the role of the right in all of this, right? Yeah. And kind of specifically the Christian Democratic sort of- No, because it's interesting. I, I mean, I had something to say about that when I initially wrote um, and drafted the paper for, for today, but actually within the movement of liberalization of opening the regime, um, there, there are elections um, as fake as they could be, uh, but you know there was uh, only one political party that went to. to, to but they integrated uh, what they called the liberal wing, which were young lawyers um, and not only and businessmen who were prone to some opening of the regime and democratization. You know, and they had some hopes that that would happen. And by 72, 71, 72, they realize they were just fooling us. So what they do is they leave um, and they start um, to go back to also to Rachel's question about civil and civil, but, um, but they also start forming civil society organizations that come to be still today one some of the most important, mo mo most more influential ones. Uh, they founded um, a newspaper, for instance, uh, that's still today very influential. Um, and they also found an organization that produces studies and sort of a think tank that tries to bring all of these people together, right? So, and this liberal wing is that, um, what came to be in second place and the, the center, the center right in, in in Portugal. So you know the as they they were already there and they come to form this new political party. You then also have a second one with with people closer to the regime, the Popular Party, right? But uh, eventually they they didn't win any seats in the last elections, right? So they're being replaced by the more radical right and the liberal right. Um, and then there were also the, the ultras, but mainly at the military level um, and with small organizations. And they were, during the hot summer, they were like trying to mobilize to attack uh, the communists and the communist centers in the north of the country. So they played a role as well. Uh, I don't want to for the revolution in Portugal to be and the, what happened just to be a left wing <laughs> um, um, portrait, so to say. Yeah. Could I ask Ken to tell us what happened to the right in Chile after Pinochet fell? Well, the rights reconstructed uh, in into two two new political parties. Uh, one which was sort of the old right reborn, and the other which was a new, very technocratic neoliberal right uh, that was very explicitly pro Pinochet. And so that's the, the so called UDI, uh, both of which are now being supplanted by this new far right around, uh, you know, a figure that has emerged sort of um, in Chile. So, but the Chilean right itself had to get re, had to be reconstructed um, and organizationally after after Pinochet stepped down. But what's interesting about the Christian Democrats is they they really occupied the centrist space in Chile. They they displaced the old what was called the radical party and then they occupied the center. So even though the Christian Democrats came out of the conservative party, um, they occupied the centrist space. And then they became for a long time, they were the linchpin because Chile has what we call three thirds left you know, left third, center third, right third. And so depending upon whether the center leans left or lean right, you can only construct a majority if you've got the center with you. Uh, so they really became the linchpin. Um, and, but there was actually a left within the Christian Democrats so under the, the, the Allende period, keep in mind the time of liberation theology, you had a Christian left, several factions which broke off from the Christian Democrats and joined Allende. Um, yeah, but then the, the core of the party supported the coup against Allende, 
thinking that it was, I mean, they never dreamed that Pinochet was going to take power for 17 years. They, they thought this would be a caretaker government for six months or a year, and then you'd have new elections and they'd be back in power. Uh, so the Christian Democrats went along with the coup for the most part, but then uh, began to distance themselves when it became clear that Pinochet was going to be there indefinitely. And as the level of human rights violations of it became so extreme, uh, the Catholic Church was the main umbrella to support any, because the left couldn't organize at all. So the Catholic Church was the umbrella where human rights work took place. So the Christian Democrats became at least somewhat involved in defending human rights. And then with the with the start of the protest movement in 83, that's when the Christian Democrats moved decisively towards opposing the dictatorship. So at that point, you get the center in alliance with the left opposing the dictatorship. And it's just a question of how does the transition unfold? But to the, you know, but ultimately, oh, since since Pinochet has been gone, this the center they since the 90s, the Christian Democrats have weakened dramatically and are now uh, a very weak political force. And so this is part of what you see, the new polarization. The center has, the organ, there's still a centrist third, but it's not organized. It has no partisan representation. So you have cast on the far right. You have this new left emerging out of the protest movement that is sort of organized in a new friendly amplio, but it's not, you know, but a lot of, a lot of these social networks are not much engaged in the partisan sphere. Um, and so you've got a real vacuum organizationally um, that has that is part of this new crisis of representation in the country. That's amazing. So I think we, we have to end it here before we thank our incredible speakers. I, Mabel has one announcement to share for the institute. I just want to just announce our last talk because it actually articulates well with some of what was discussed here today. It's by a, uh, a historical political economist at the New School, and the title is The Capital Order, How Economists Invented wow. Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. And the two central, it, the two cases are Italy and England, and one of the major characters in it is Luigi Rinaldi. So <laughs> there will be a lot of local interest, and I will be getting in touch. What is the date? The date is April 13th at noon, and we will definitely be getting up to you, Sid. But everybody, of course, should come. <laughs> Wonderful. And with that, I just want to thank our experts. I think this is a really important conversation that resonates with the historical cases and the questions for today um, in terms of contesting autocracy. So thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And welcome um, to Cornell, and, and thanks for joining us here. Thank you.